being able to visualize your data in new and easier to understand ways, I think really allows you to gain additional insights and then take action on those insights. This podcast is brought to you by the team at Bowster Geospatial Productions in conjunction with our affiliates, Esri Australia, Esri Singapore, Esri Malaysia, and Esri Indonesia. To get your hands on more short, sharp, and immediately usable resources, head to the GIS Directions podcast website and check out the show notes. Welcome to GIS Directions. I'm Wayne Lee Archer. And I'm Simon Jackson. And joining us today, we're very excited to have Maggie Busek, Product Manager with Esri Inc.'s ArcGIS Enterprise team. Welcome along, Maggie. Thanks. It's so great to be here. So, Maggie, there's this new long-term support release of ArcGIS Enterprise that's now available. That's 11.1. So today, we want to kind of focus on that core ArcGIS Enterprise stack talk about all of the new cool stuff that's available in that release. We know there's all the other enterprise roles like GeoVent and Knowledge Server and you know, also the Kubernetes. But today, let's kind of jump into what's new in Arches Enterprise 11.1. Sounds great. Maggie, before we talk about the what's new, can you tell us a little bit more about your role and kind of what you get up to in the Arches Enterprise team and which bits you focus on? As Wayne said, I'm a product manager on the ArcGIS Enterprise team, and as our listeners probably know, it's a big product, so I don't do everything for (laughs) Enterprise, but I have a few areas of focus. Things that I think a lot about are things like upgrades, the Enterprise portal, accessibility. I also work on our Enterprise beta program and looking at new things all the time to take onto my plate. That beta program interests me, so that's something that came along at 11.0, isn't it, where there was suddenly this option for the administrator to decide if they wanted to enable new features. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? So at 11.0, we introduced two new concepts that related to beta and beta features, beta programs. So at 11.0, we started the new version of our enterprise beta program. And through the enterprise beta program, we put out a couple of releases in advance of the final version of the software for early testing. This is a great opportunity for users to get a look at new features that are coming, prepare for those, maybe do some training internally to get ready for those new things that are coming in the next release. And that started at 11.0, and it's something that we've continued with 11.1. We're even looking at our beta program for 11.2 currently. And then also at 11.0, we introduced this concept of beta features as well. So these are features that are in beta themselves, but are in a final release of the software. So at 11.0, we had things like service webhooks that were in beta. We had Windows containers for notebook server, which were in beta. And these have a different promise for support around them than all of the other features in the final release. But it's a great way to test things that are being finalized and going to be fully fleshed out in a following release. So at 11.0, we have those beta features. We don't have them in 11.1 because we only have beta features in short-term support releases, and 11.1 is a long-term support release. But we look forward to potentially having other beta features in a future short-term support release. And you mentioned the long-term support release and short-term support release. Can you just remind me, with 11.1, which is a long-term support release, what does that mean? Is that That's a longer support period, is it? Yes, that's right. So any given version of Enterprise has a support window associated with it. We determine this with our product lifecycle. And so we have this concept of short-term support releases and long-term support releases. Short-term support releases have technical support for three years, and we provide patching for a year and a half. And then long-term support releases you might guess, have a longer window of support, and those have six years of technical support and four years of patching associated with them. So 11.1 is our most recent long-term support release. And typically, we see users moving to both our short-term and long-term support releases, but often we see even wider adoption of our long-term support releases just because of that longer support window. The new stuff that's there at 11.1, there's quite a big list. So I feel like we should limit the scope to Windows and Linux deployments, because there's a whole bunch of new stuff in the Kubernetes 11.1 release as well. And again, I guess Arches Enterprise, as you said, Maggie, it's a huge product. And I feel like we should narrow in on the traditional base Arches Enterprise deployment and the the portal and the data store and and the GIS server. What are some of the the new things within that base stack that you're particularly excited about at the 11.1 release? 
I think zooming out a little bit, thinking about our high level message and focus for the release with each release of Enterprise, we try and have a key message and motivation behind it. And for 11.1, our key focus is the ability to enable our users to make high quality decisions quickly. So this is something we want Enterprise to support regardless of what version you're on. We know Enterprise is this foundational product that's at the center of all of your GIS workflows and it enables you to gain insights and inform really important decision making. And at 11.1, we really focused on this message and we have a few features that I think speak really well to that. So new enhancements in our map viewer and scene viewer, building those out to add additional context to your data through new visualization tools and adding some real world context to your data, some means to do your work more efficiently in the enterprise portal as well. And then we also have some pretty exciting extensibility features that came out in 11.1. We know enterprise out of the box can do a lot of incredible things and it works very well for many of our users just out of the box, but there are users that want to be able to customize and extend the functionality of enterprise with extensibility tools. And so we built out this story with webhooks and custom data feeds at 11.1. So those are the things I'm probably most excited about. One of the things that interests me is that um, custom data feeds that you just mentioned, Maggie, exactly how's it going to work? How's it going to be useful? So custom data feeds, we are really excited about because we see this as the opportunity to kind of unlock data that might have been hard to pull into enterprise previously. And so how this works is you can work with any data source, even ones that aren't natively supported by ArcGIS. It could be a MongoDB database. It could be an Elasticsearch database. It could be a GeoJSON feed on your city's website. And in order to access them and pull them into your enterprise system, What you'll do is configure a custom data provider, and that custom data provider will enable you to have the ArcGIS server component of ArcGIS Enterprise go out and fetch from that data source and pull it in to Enterprise as a read-only feature layer. From there, it takes on the security of a normal feature layer within the ArcGIS Enterprise, and then you can interact with it with an Enterprise, pull it into maps and things like that. So we're really excited about it because it's Number one, data sources that aren't necessarily natively supported with ArcGIS traditionally and allowing you to pull in that data from new sources without having to process it, maybe do some ETL work prior to getting it into enterprise. And then you also don't need to be the owner of the data that you are working with and pulling into enterprise with these custom data feeds. So I mentioned that GeoJSON feed on a city's website. You can configure a custom data provider for that GeoJSON feed and pull it directly into enterprise without actually being the owner of that GeoJSON feed. So one consideration I do want to point out is you will need a developer in order to help you configure that custom data provider that's required to pull in that data source. So I know... Many listeners probably have developers within their organization. Maybe you don't and you need to work with someone else. So just figuring out what the right resource for that would be. I guess the other one that you mentioned, Maggie, was, was webhooks. And from what, I, what I've read, it, it kind of is broken down into these organization webhooks, but then also feature and, and geoprocessing webhooks. Can you elaborate a little bit more on those and, and how they might be useful for a GIS administrator? So webhooks are not necessarily a new concept to the ArcGIS system and organizational webhooks. We actually introduced a couple of releases ago, but at a very high level, essentially what a webhook does is it will have a particular action happen within enterprise for an organizational webhook, for instance, maybe an item's being created, maybe a user's being deleted, things like that, and it'll send a notification to an administrator. And so it's a proactive approach. It's a don't call us, we'll call you approach that, again, is sending those proactive notifications when an action happens. So organizational webhooks we've had, we have other types of webhooks throughout the ArcGIS system. But what we're really excited about in 11.1 is the introduction of service webhooks. So we have both feature service webhooks and then geoprocessing webhooks. With feature service webhooks, these are going to send notifications when what we call CRUD events happen. So create, read, update, and delete. If you have a feature that's been deleted or um, a new one that's been created, you'll get a notification if you have that webhook configured. And then geoprocessing webhooks will send notification when a geoprocessing job is finished. So we all know geoprocessing jobs can finish in a variety of ways. Maybe they complete successfully. That's great. But they could also fail. They could be ended. And so you'll get a notification regardless of what that kind of finished state is. And so 
that proactive notification we're really excited about. You're not going to have to spend so much time going back and clicking, is this done yet? Is this done yet? What's changed? You'll just get those notifications and kind of be able to focus on the important work that you're doing instead of going back and checking on things. So we're really excited to expand that story of webhooks. That is super exciting. It sounds like a a really handy uh, integration point to integrate with third-party utilities. We do a lot of uh, integration with, you know, asset management systems, for example, in the utility space where I work. This sounds like the perfect sort of segue into how we can actually integrate with some of these solutions. I'm really excited about these webhooks. You mentioned integration there, Wayne. I know you do a lot of work in that space. I feel like a combination of the custom data feeds into sort of third-party systems, pulling data out of those systems and surfacing it in ArcGIS as just a you know a regular feature service. But then also the opposite, right? Being able to listen out for when someone creates a feature in the GIS and send a payload to another system to also generate or get an asset ID and things like that. It feels like it's going to open up a lot of options. Those are my key features. I'm, I'm taking those one and I'm running with them. Those are my two key features from this release. So I guess, Maggie, I'm, I'm more on the front end and, and quite interested in some of those improvements to the map viewer and the scene viewer. Like in particular, I saw that chart style appear in Enterprise 11.1, which working with census data over here is, is a great style to sort of get an understanding and, and breaking up that census data. Have you sort of seen any other improvements in the map viewer or scene viewer that are worth shouting out about? Yeah, we're really excited about that chart styling as well. We're also excited about some of the aggregation styling enhancements that we've had come to the map viewer in 11.1. So things like binning has been introduced in 11.1. We've also seen improvements for heat maps. So we're getting better performance with heat maps now. We support pop-ups with heat maps. So kind of expanding the functionality there and thinking back to that key message of making high quality decisions quickly, being able to visualize your data in new and easier to understand ways, I think really allows you to gain additional insights and then take action on those insights. In the scene viewer, as you mentioned, we've added some exciting things to give more real world context to the scenes you're interacting with. So things like weather effects are, I think, really cool dimensions, being able to see those kind of real world measurements for the different things you're interacting with within your scene are super exciting. So yes, lots of new enhancements within the map viewer and scene viewer to look forward to. Enterprise obviously has an in- integrated with the ArcGIS Living Atlas and there's the the open street map building and tree layout. So not just 2D, but actually kind of 3D representations of buildings and trees. And the open street map data for Australia is, is really good. So being able to kind of just complement your existing scenes with that layer is is really worth looking at. The secret and not so hidden developer in me um, spotted another feature in there that may be useful for some of our people out there. And this is the arcade editor. Tell me a little bit about the arcade editor. This has been a bit of a game changer for me. Yeah, so we have made some substantial enhancements there at 11.1 as well. We've been focused on how to make it kind of easier and more efficient to write Arcade with the Arcade Editor. And so now with the IntelliSense functionality, we've added that and we're excited. It provides suggestions as you're writing your Arcade, prompting you and kind of making that easier with autocomplete functions, helping you find errors and things like that. And then just from a user experience um, perspective, we've also modernized the layout for the arcade editor. So it's a more easy look and feel when you're interacting with it. One of the other ones that we know a lot of our clients have been asking about is some of them have things like Google BigQuery and Snowflake. And I, I saw that Eleven has support for tapping into those data stores. Yep. So cloud data warehouses are something that we've supported since 1091. We've heard the interest in being able to leverage those data sources and pull that data into ArcGIS Enterprise. And so starting at 1091, we introduced support for cloud data warehouses from BigQuery, like you mentioned, Snowflake, and then also Redshift. And we've been expanding this story over the last couple of releases. Originally, you were only able to publish map image layers from those cloud data warehouses, but we've expanded this story in both 11.0 and 11.1, and now you can publish feature layers from BigQuery and now Snowflake at 11.1. That's going to shift gears. I know there's there's plenty of plenty more stuff in, in 11.1 that we could talk about. I want to sort of talk about how we can get to 11.1. And from what I understand, maybe there's two ways of looking at it. So if you're on an older version and you have a, a bunch of services that you've published over that version, maybe even previous versions, and then you've also got a, a range of content that's sitting in your portal, like apps and web maps and dashboards and so forth. When you're moving to 11.1, 1, 
what are some of the key questions you should sort of be asking yourself before rushing ahead and, and clicking the upgrade button? So upgrading is something we always encourage you to think through before you do it. We want to be taking backups and just have a plan, making sure that it's a thoughtful process. And this is still true if you're upgrading to 11.1. There might even be a little bit more pre-planning depending on which version you're coming from. So I think I want to zoom back to the 11.0 release a little bit because we are building on some of those significant changes that we introduced at 11.0 in this new version of 11.1. So at 11.0, we removed support for the ArcMap runtime. This is what enables you to publish services from ArcMap to ArcGIS Enterprise. And so we know many of our users have moved away from ArcMap. There are in ArcGIS Pro, which we're really excited about. But if you are still using ArcMap and you're still using those services within ArcGIS Enterprise, you're going to have to do some work to migrate those services to ArcGIS Pro prior to moving to 11.0 or onwards like 11.1. An excellent reason to get onto Pro. Yes, exactly. We're always encouraging that. We also know this removal of the ArcMap runtime is a pretty significant one, and it was a big breaking change at 11.0. And so we tried to couple that with some other significant changes just because we knew there was going to be some planning associated with moving to the 11x generation anyway and wanted to have some significant transitions happen all at once instead of having big changes with every coming release. And so some of our older app and app templates have been retired at 11.0 and onwards into 11.1. So things like classic story maps templates, some of the older configurable apps templates, ArcGIS dashboards classics. And so we have a very thorough list of all of the considerations that you need to think through prior to upgrading to 11.0 or 11.1 from those older versions. But we also try to make this process hopefully as easy as possible with some in-app tooling. And so one really big piece of it is those ArcMap-based services. If you're still using them, some ArcMap-based services will migrate automatically when you upgrade to 11.0 or 11.1. Your feature layers, your map layer, or feature services, your map services, but some things you have to actually manually migrate. So things like geoprocessing services aren't going to automatically migrate. We have some tooling to help you migrate those automatically, like I said, and then also take an inventory of which services you're going to have to manually migrate. We introduced this tooling back at 10.9, built on it in 10.9.1, and then continue to offer it in 11.0 and onwards just to help aid in that process. For the apps and app templates that we retire, the level of migration really kind of depends on what it is. For the Esri Story Maps classics templates, you are going to have to rebuild those story maps. And so that's a little bit more migration, but things like the classic dashboards, when you open them within 11.1 or 11.0, that will have automatically migrated. You don't have to do anything to migrate content to the new ArcGIS dashboard. So those are things to think about. We don't want this process to be hard or scary, but just something that you have to be thoughtful about and kind of map out in advance. So one recommendation we have is going to 10.9.1 prior to going to 11.0 or 11.1. We know many users are already on 10.9.1, but 10.9.1 is a really good release because it has these older versions of some of the things we retire at 11.0 and onwards. It supports both ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro-based services. So it's a great place to do that migration work in advance of going to 11X. So if you're on a release prior to 10.9.1, we recommend going there prior to going to 11.0 or 11.1. That is a super tip. So that's sort of like the proving ground where you can actually do some of that migration work that's going to need to be done. I think that's a great tip. Thank you so much for that one, Maggie. Absolutely. And we, again, know this could be a big transition. And so we have a lot of documentation and resources around this work and recommendations of moving to 10.9.1 first. So we have some blog posts and um, product documentation that definitely are a good thing to take advantage of as you think about this process. Great. Now we, we hear that you know, some of the older apps have been deprecated. Um, is Web App Builder still hanging on in there in uh, in 11.1? Yes, we have Web App Builder and experience builder as well. It's kind of newer version in Enterprise 11.1. So that you don't need to worry about migrating quite yet, but you should be thinking about moving those workflows that you have been doing with Web App Builder onto Experience Builder where it makes sense. Maggie, I feel like under the hood with the upgrade process, your team's done something, some improvements to kind of speed things up. Like I've noticed going from from 10.8 to 10.9 to 11 to 11.1 on my, my lab environments that have quite a lot of content 
I noticed for one that the kind of the, the GUI seems to have more options, but also watching the status bar seems to have got quicker over the versions. Is that what's happening under there? <laughs> Yes, that's been something that we've put a lot of effort into over the past few releases. We want you as users to be able to take advantage of all the new and exciting stuff with each release. And so we want to make that upgrade process as easy and quick as possible. And so we've been thinking about how to do that. And so we introduced a lot of work at 1091 to improve that underlying framework that powers our upgrades and make that process faster. But we're really seeing the full kind of realization of this work at 11.1. So we also have been aware of the fact that sometimes you want to see where you're at in the process when you're upgrading. When you're upgrading enterprise, you go component by component, and sometimes it might feel like a little bit of a black box of like, okay, I'm upgrading Portal for ArcGIS. Where in this process am I at? So a couple of releases ago, we introduced a means to check where you're at in the process. You know, if there's a few steps, it'll show you incrementally what place you're at in this upgrade. So you have a sense of how you're progressing. We think that improves the experience and we're thinking about how we might move that to other components in the future. Like I said, it's specific to Portal for ArcGIS for now. But again, thinking about what this might look like in the future across enterprise. That's great work. So something me and Wayne have debated over the years is what's best practice for upgrades? Like, like doing an in-place upgrade to an existing environment and potentially having some downtime for users or having to sort of do it over out-of-office hours versus that approach of deploying a fresh environment from scratch and migrating content across and then shifting people to the new environment. Is there a best practice around that or is it kind of case by case? It really depends on the organization. There's different considerations that different enterprise users really need to make when they're upgrading, but it really depends on kind of your organization's needs, what type of downtime you're working with. We know different enterprise users have different service level agreements with their users. Yeah, it's something for you to consider on an organization by organization basis. One last thing I was going to ask you about, Maggie, is have you seen much around people sort of moving away from clicking through, doing upgrades from GUIs to moving to kind of DevOps workflows? How, how much of a shift have you seen from the global users that are upgrading? Again, that's another thing that depends on the organization and the makeup of your team. We are actively improving all of those different options for upgrading just to make sure regardless of what the right fit for your organization is, you have a good process for upgrading. And so we see it pretty spread out across our different users, again, just kind of dependent on what works best for any given organization. You mentioned backups, Maggie. So what's your recommended approach for before you even start an upgrade? How should someone back up? Wayne, I'm actually kind of interested to hear your perspective on this, because from my understanding, you do a lot of upgrades within the Edry Australia upgrades team. So I'm interested in what your experience out in the field has been. Wow, I didn't expect to be on the the receiving end of the questions. (laughs) Uh, Excellent. This is a bit of a rebellion going on. You know, we've got a lot of tools uh, in the toolkit in this space. Migration between environments uh, isn't just about when we're doing upgrades. Migration between environments is also about when you might be moving between, say, a dev and a test or a prod and a, and a pre-prod environment, we still need to migrate content between places. This is not just about backups for backup purposes, but it's also using backups for migrating content between environments as well. And we've still got the old staple uh, that we keep turning to, and that's WebGISDR. The WebGIS DR Toolkit really has stayed with us throughout the years. So uh, I think my tip as far as, as that is concerned is to really lean on WebGIS DR. If we can uh, get the routine in place that makes WebGIS DR work, get those snapshots and those backups happening regularly, get them stored on different storage. So don't save them on your C drive so that when you fail, you're happy. All of those kind of things taken into consideration. WebGIS DR is really going to be your savior, not just when something goes wrong and and everything falls in a smoking heap, but also when you're moving between environments, you can actually use WebGIS DR very cleverly then. Yeah, that's great advice. All right. We've talked about upgrades. Um, What, Maggie, can you tell me about the future? What should we expect to see in 11.2, 11.3? What's coming next, Maggie? Well, I uh, want to take this opportunity to plug the beta program for Enterprise. This is a great way for users to get a look at things that are coming. As I mentioned, we're getting our 11.2 beta program together, and we have some exciting stuff that users will get to test by participating in that program. So I'm going to point to that. We also often talk about this in our Road Ahead sessions at our different Esri conferences, so that's a great place to hear what's new. 
Thank you so much for that uh, coy answer there, Maggie. But I understand. Let's give 11 one its day in the sunshine is what I'm hearing. Exactly. So just to wrap up, Maggie, what are your top three highlights for 11 one? I think custom data feeds we're super excited about. I know that was something Wayne was smiling about. So I'm yep. really excited for that to be coming. Service webhooks are another big one that we see a lot of possibilities with, both for feature services and then geoprocessing as well. And then I think some of the enhancements in the scene viewer, I just find really cool things like the weather effects and stuff like that, give that real world feel to the scenes you're interacting with there. So some of that I think is very flashy and exciting. So yeah, super excited about 11.1. And there's a ton that we, of course, couldn't cover in our podcast today, but I would say those are my top three. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today, Maggie. Thank you so much for having me. And so that's it, folks. Some short, sharp, and immediately usable features to update your organization's capability. And to get you started with these tips and tricks, we've added all of the resources we've spoken about today to the website. That's gisdirectionspodcast.com.au. And that includes all of the information that you'll need to get started with ArcGIS Enterprise 11.1. We'd also love to hear from any tips from our listeners, you, the ArcGIS community. Jump onto the website, send them through, or connect with us on LinkedIn, and hopefully we can feature some of those tips as part of upcoming episodes. Wonderful stuff. Stay spatial. Until next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the hosts and guests, and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Balstead Geospatial Group of Companies.